So welcome to our, uh, our session, Groundwater is a Cause and Cure of Water Insecurity. So this is kind of a big deal for us groundwater types because I, uh, I think we haven't always had the opportunity to, to gather like this. So this is kind of a, a good opportunity for, for us to kind of see what's going on, especially between uh, Saskatchewan and Waterloo. Um, so on that note, I will uh, do our land acknowledgement. And so we pay our uh, respect to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. So that would be Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis here in Saskatoon. And uh, would you know, ask that you think about, you know, doing your own kind of personal acknowledgement to those of you who are joining us from Ontario and Quebec and, and beyond. Um, so uh, with that, I mean, just go through kind of the rules of the game here in terms of, uh, I guess that's our land acknowledgement, moving through, and of course, everything's always we're awkward on Zoom. Okay, so how's code keeping? Um, for those of you who, uh, I guess, are just joining us, uh, Questions use the Q&A feature, uh, so those will show up in the chat. Sessions are being recorded, made available afterwards, uh, and we've got slides uploaded, uh, or, or they will be uploaded, so Stacy's been collecting those, and uh, we do have closed captioning available. Um, so Code of Conduct, um, a little late, I guess this is uh, one of the last concurrent sessions here, but I would ask uh, that we all respect each other and, and follow the rest of the rules here. And we've got our uh, code of conduct listed uh, here for those of you uh, to review. So uh, without further ado, I guess we'll introduce our first speaker here. I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, so what's this all here? So there's <laughs> Jeff McKenzie with uh, the great headshot there. And uh, so I guess just to introduce Jeff, Jeff has uh, a bachelor's degree from McGill, master's and PhD from uh, Syracuse and a postdoc at Ohio State. He's currently a professor and department chair at, uh, at McGill. And uh, really, we're lucky to have Jeff uh, here. I mean, uh, cold regions hydrology being such a feature within the GWF program. And uh, I can say this without reservation that, that Jeff really is one of our leaders in cold regions hydrology and especially on the groundwater side. So um, won't take up any more of his time and uh, turn it over to Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, thank you, Grant. That was a generous introduction. Um, yeah, just a, a land acknowledgement where I'm sitting today in, in Montreal. Obviously, McGill University in Montreal is situated on the traditional territory of the Canada, Ka, Ka, apologies for my pronunciation, uh, a place which has long served as the meeting site of, of a, a site of meeting and exchange amongst um, First Nations. And I will now share my screen here. If I can get this going. Apologies here. Share. All right. So today I'll talk a little bit about groundwater resources and thawing cold regions. I thought I'd talk a little bit about why groundwater is important when we think about the North, talk just very briefly about what, what I've been thinking about in terms of research, and then talk a little bit about our, we have a GWF funded project thinking about groundwater vulnerability and thought I'd talk a little bit about that and how some of the people in fact who are gonna to speak today, how we can all sort of fit into this thought about, my thoughts about groundwater vulnerability. <laughs> um, of course, now I'll go to the next slide. <laughs> um, so uh, probably stating the obvious, cold regions are changing. <laughs> right? I mean, the Arctic is warming fast and people often use the, the statistic that you know the Arctic is warming at twice the global average rate due to climate change. Permafrost, so permafrost is perennially frozen ground or ground that stays at or below zero degrees Celsius for two or more years. Permafrost is thawing rapidly and we believe it's gonna continue to thaw into the future. And this picture in the bottom right here, or graph on the bottom right, is from the Swiper Report, which is a cold regions um, multinational document that came out a few years ago. Um, it predicts that over the next, by the end of the century, that we're going to have 30 to 80 percent less permafrost in, in the Arctic globally. And we know that as permafrost thaws, it influences a lot of different environmental factors, such as hydrology, which is what we're talking about today, but also ecological, geotechnical, and geochemical conditions in the north. Um, it also starts feeding into sort of societal change as well. And so in this context of a rapidly changing north, um, the question is, is groundwater important in a changing Arctic? And I won't keep you in suspense as to the answer to this question. I'm a hydrogeologist. Um, yes, of course, groundwater is important. The answer is always groundwater. 
Um, but let's talk about why groundwater is important in this setting. So one thing we already know, I think we have some good evidence that groundwater is changing in the north. And I see we have a talk later on talking about, about base flow. Um, and we've been thinking a little bit about base flow in the north and in particular winter um, discharge in the north in rivers and streams. So here's a map of all the stations for the water survey stations across the north. Each dot or triangle is a different water station. And anywhere where we see um, a red triangle is a place where over the past 30 years, we can statistically say there's been an increase in winter base flow. Blue triangles are a decrease in black dots. There's, there's no trend. But really when we look at this, we can see that in Western, Western Northern Canada, sort of Yukon and Western Northwest Territories, we're really seeing an increase in, in winter base flow. Um, and the shading behind the diagram there, darker shading is where we have continuous permafrost down to light gray is where we have um, discontinuous or sporadic permafrost. And so we're sort of seeing in these transition zones where we're losing permafrost, we're seeing increased winter base flow. So this would be a good sign that over the past 30 years, something is changing um, in terms of hydrology. And as hydrogeologists, we think about base flow. I mean, in the winter in the north, the only place where we would expect to find liquid water would be in the ground, making it to rivers or streams. Um, so we really think of this as maybe a sign of increased groundwater intensity over the past 30 years. And so we have a bit of a model for how we think, um, very, very simple model, but uh, how we think about permafrost and groundwater. This is sort of a well often cited image from Michelle Walbert, who works for the US Geological Survey and Barrett Kirillik, who's now at Dalhousie University. Um, and so we can think about the um, uh, Northern landscape. We have permafrost. Permafrost is relatively impermeable to groundwater flow. So it acts as an, an aquitard. <laughs> Um, so we have recharge that comes down the land surface. It goes into the zone above permafrost, which we call the um, active zone, the area that thaws and freezes every year seasonally. And water then flows to lakes or rivers. And below lakes or rivers, we can get sort of holes developing in permafrost, which we call talic or talix. Um, and this is sort of a result of a thermal blanket effect from large lakes or rivers. <laughs> so we can take this in and we start to add, add heat and heat this up a little bit over time. Um, and what we start to see is that permafrost distribution decreases. So we get a larger active zone. We can even get situations where refreezing at the land surface does not come all the way back down to permafrost in the winter. So we get lateral openings or lateral flow happening above permafrost, but below top of frozen ground. We can also get open talix forming. So we can get basically connections between deeper groundwater and shallower groundwater. And we can get enhanced recharge effectively as permafrost the top of the permafrost, they call the permafrost table, drops lower. We can then actually have more space, you could think of it, to, to put in, say, snow melt in the spring or, or recharge through the year. So the net result of all of these, these changes with the warmer climate in the, in the north is that we can think of increased connectivity, more connection between shallow and deep groundwater, more connection between recharge and, and expanding or shrinking rivers and lakes. And so people obviously are, are thinking a lot about the the, the north and thinking about climate change and how it's affecting the north. And over the past five years, there have been a couple of great reports that have came out. On the far right here is the SWIPA report, Snow, Water, and Ice. And the OCCC report from the IPCC came out a few years ago, 2019, a couple of years ago, you know, really focused on how the climate change is affecting the north. And if you read these reports or do keyword searches in them, what really shows up is that groundwater is missing. <laughs> and this is, again, I'm probably preaching to the choir given, you know, the, the topic of the session. But groundwater we think is actually probably pretty important in the north as we start thawing the north. And it's really not getting the sort of, I don't know, airplay in these sort of reports. So I've been sort of trying to work to raise awareness for groundwater in the north. Um, so my own personal research is a quick sort of snapshot of the kinds of things I do. What I've done over the past decade is really thought a lot about how we can build numerical groundwater models that incorporate freezing and thawing, basically thinking about how permafrost might form or thaw over time, how ground freezing might affect groundwater flow and groundwater systems. And these models are pretty cool. They sort of account for variable heat conditions as you start to freeze and thaw the ground. Um, they have what's called the freezing characteristic curve, so a relationship between temperature below zero and how much of your pore space is frozen or unfrozen. Um, permeability decreases as the ground freezes and latent heat effects. Latent heat's a really big, a big issue as you cross that zero C boundary. And there's now actually a bunch of models. Initially, there's only a couple of models. The model I work with is called SUTRA, which is the US Geological Survey model, which we've updated and now most people call it SUTRA ICE to do this freeze thaw. And one thing just to say with these models is the, 
I sort of, you know, you look back and it seemed complicated to build this model at the time. But now really what's come out is I think what I'm better appreciating what really matters in these models and we don't do well, I don't wanna say we, but I do not do well maybe, is um, what happens at the land surface. So for example, you build a, a regular groundwater model you put on some recharge, you know, as long as it's less in precipitation, a lot less in precipitation, you feel like this could be a recharge value. But for a, a model that also has temperature in it, you really need to start thinking about other processes. What happened at the land surface? What's the temperature of that recharge that goes into the land surface? Is there, you know, heat conduction through a snowpack? All these sort of questions are going to be really important and also really challenging for hydrogeologic models to incorporate these. So there's some still a lot of work to be done in this in this area. So just to give one quick snapshot of the types of research we've done, this is some work from um, a student of mine, PhD student Pierre Lamontagne Halle. And we built a model. This is sort of the cartoon version of the results. Um, so we built a model of a very simple hill slope. Um, permafrost is in blue. Um, we have sort of the, the annual active zone and sort of a lake ray at the top. We have a, a small river here. We have sort of a bit of italic underneath the river. As we envision in summer and winter, summer we get sort of shallow flow. We get a lot of return flows that go back to the land surface. And in the winter, obviously, there's not a lot of flow because everything's frozen. And then we apply this sort of a rapid warming that we expect to see in the Arctic. And as we see this, we actually then start getting sort of a deeper active zone each, each summer. So we start getting longer flow paths developing in this active zone. Um, we have a sort of a mixed zone that starts developing where it's have a mixture of something people call it the mushy zone, which is a cool name, uh, sort of a mixture of water and ice in the pore space. And in this case, by 40 years, we actually start getting a lateral talic that stays open through the winter, which can then start explaining how we would get increased um, winter base flow in these types of settings. Um, and if we run this even farther forward, we then start actually getting drying out of the upland areas. So we get these longer flow paths, we get water coming out to the discharge area. That's sort of a cool, I mean, obviously a very simple model, but it starts explaining this paradox that we sort of see a little bit in the Arctic in some places of you know, drying uplands, drying peatlands, but we also see this increased base flow. And, you know, we can use numerical models to try to come up with a process or a mechanism that, that can explain these, these different observations. So out of all this, and what I've been thinking about, and especially think about groundwater resources, um, sort of this is my, my mantra lately, I guess, you know, as the Arctic warms and permafrost thaws, cryohydrogeology will be a potential emerging catalyst of northern environmental change. So cryohydrogeology is sort of the term we've been trying to use more lately, this idea of cold regions, hydrogeology. And sort of cool, it sounds like an oxymoron, but I think it makes sense when you think about a thawing, thawing cold place. And I'll give you some examples right now of how we think that groundwater could be a catalyst of change. So this is from a paper that came out last year, or I guess not really a paper, more of a, a, an opinion piece that came out in the, cry the cryosphere. Um, thinking about what we think is going to, how groundwater is going to play with, with warmer temperatures in the north and as permafrost thaws. So a few things. One, obviously, um, permafrost thaws, there's just increased groundwater flux, more connectivity, more potential for deeper groundwater to get to shallow, more active zone flow. Um, another way that groundwater is going to be important is lateral transport of carbon by groundwater. People talk a lot about the, the Arctic carbon bomb, this idea, all this carbon is stored in permafrost and permafrost thaws and groundwater would sort of explain this mechanism where we can move a lot of carbon potentially from these permafrost regions to rivers and streams or to the land surface. Um, potential for contaminant transport. There are a lot of contaminated, surprisingly large number of contaminated sites in the north um, as permafrost thaws, basically the active zone gets larger, more space, I think of it as for, for contaminant transport or you know larger transmissivity. Uh, more groundwater resource development, so people can possibly use groundwater more as a drinking water source or for other activities. More infrastructure, um, potentially de degraded by groundwater. It's a big issue if you build something on permafrost, permafrost thaws, you can have subsidence. And we think that groundwater can actually accelerate how quickly permafrost thaws. Or in some cases, we actually did a project looking at a road site on the Alaskan Highway and groundwater flowing through the, the road base material, in fact, was causing a sort of a feedback that was accelerating how quickly the road was, was collapsing. Um, and finally, I think that, and this is what we've been talking about with our Northern partners um, in Northwest Territories and Yukon, is sort of thinking about how do we better plan and good policy for groundwater resources in the North, which is sort of there, but as groundwater becomes more prominent, will require more attention. 
So Northern groundwater resources, a small population and critical questions. Um, in Northern Canada, um, Yukon, I heard recently 99% of people in the Yukon use groundwater for drinking water as their domestic drinking water source. None of it in Northwest Territories, less than 5%, and none of it, I mean, sorry, in Northwest Territories, it was only three small communities use groundwater for the drinking water source. Everyone else uses basically surface water. And so this is an example for Northwest Territories, this picture at the bottom here, this red house here, inside here, there's actually a, a well, a pumping well that pumps water and it comes out of this little spigot thing around the side of the building here. Basically a truck shows up twice a day and then delivers water to the 300 residents in this community called Wati in Northwest Territories. It's a few hours drive west of, of Yellowknife. Um, and so it's sort of an interesting spot. This is sort of what the system looks like. I think it's fairly common in the north. So basically this is the pumping well, it's only about 12 meters deep. And basically it is a um, sort of an infiltration galley type of setup. So you have the lake here, Lake Lamarck, and basically they're drawing water from this lake. We did some isotope work on this. We're drawing water from the lake to this well, and then this is what the community uses. And it's basically in a fractured dolomite, dolomite setting. And again, this is sort of an interesting site. Um, so if you go a little bit inland, you actually hit permafrost pretty quickly. This is sort of an interesting site too, because we're seeing a increase of right beside the town is the outflow from the lake. And annual specific discharge here has increased by about 65 millimeters over the past about 30 or 40 years, but it's not keeping up with the rate of increase in specific precipitation. So somehow more groundwater is coming out of this site is how we're, we're reading this, sort of more flux of water through the site and not as clear where that water is coming from, but the hydrogeology at this site I think is, is changing. Um, it is worth this picture at the bottom here, sort of cool, the site up until I think a year ago, or maybe just now they're finally building a road to this community, but up until, well, we visited here a couple years ago, the only way to get here is during the winter if you want to drive during over an ice road. So this is basically, we're in the middle of the lake where this picture is taken. And so finally, just to speak a little bit about what we're working on for our GWF project, we're thinking about groundwater vulnerability assessment. There's this concept that any aquifer, any water, groundwater is in the ground can be potentially contaminated. Um, and so groundwater vulnerability assessment or GVA is basically thinking about how easily can groundwater be contaminated and then how this feeds into policy. <laughs> um, and so I always sort of like this, uh, the first rule of groundwater, this came out of this um, <laughs> National Research Council report sort of in the early nineties. First rule of groundwater vulnerability is all groundwater is vulnerable. <laughs> um, and so we've been sort of thinking about how we can understand groundwater vulnerability in the context of a northern, you know, cold regions type of setting. There has been a lot of work, the, the method called drastic, which people use a lot and other methods that have really been applied to sort of warmer places, not places with permafrost. And so we're trying to think, can we adapt these methods to cold regions? And so the few things that go into this, we want to think about cold regions, we need to think about vulnerability assessment with permafrost and frozen ground. We also need northern contaminants. Um, and I'll speak to that in just a second. I think a lot of us at GWF are actually working on this northern contaminants piece. And then also thinking about groundwater vulnerability, but also I think climate change, thinking about, you know, especially about permafrost and frozen ground also sort of plays into this. So sort of we're trying to work on developing uh, assessment methods or tools that are applicable for northern, northern regions. Um, and so, yeah, at GWF, there actually are a few groups that are working on these types of, of topics. So one, in fact, I think is after me or is second after me, Elliot's talking about um, geogenic groundwater contamination, which is a really cool topic as permafrost thaws, we're releasing a lot of metals and other things into, into the subsurface. And I didn't ask Elliot, but I borrowed a picture of his poster that he gave on Monday, um, which you should go check out. And we're gonna hear more about this research um, in a minute. Dave Rudolph's also working on this topic, looking at how, um, weird fluxes of water that happen when we, when we freeze the subsurface can actually lead to heavily strain on pipelines and so on. Um, and just had a paper that came out on this topic um, a couple weeks ago or last week. And then also, I mean, look at the Yukon, this is the map of all the contam no one contaminated sites in the Yukon. There are a fair number of contaminated sites and not a lot of remediated sites. Um, again, what's really not a large population, what 35,000 people live in the Yukon, but there's some real, you know, definitely some contaminated sites and this is a, a significant issue. <laughs> Um, and so the bigger picture being too, I think that we've actually talked about doing that, but we've not quite got there yet. It's been a weird year due to COVID, but sort of bringing everyone together, especially this group from USASC that's thinking about the geogenic contamination and so on, and sort of working together to sort of fill in some gaps on how we understand contamination in the North as it feeds into groundwater vulnerability. 
And final thing I'll say is um, conclusions. You know, so I think we have some knowledge now of gold, cold regions, groundwater processes, but man, there's still a lot to do and a lot of unknowns and um, really challenging because there's not a lot of data necessarily in the North that we would think of as hydrogeologists. So there's some real gaps to be filled. Um, a lot of work still to be done also on aquifer mapping and especially the Northern governments are really working intensively on this, both Yukon and Northwest Territories have some pretty extensive aquifer mapping projects happening right now. Vulnerability assessment, developing the right tool. And the final thing I would say too, is also capacity building. I mean, I think people in this room, or at least the speakers today, we know a lot about groundwater. We think a lot about groundwater and groundwater science, but I think there's a lot of room for um, teaching people about groundwater and help having to understand the importance of this resource is really a, you know, just as important in some ways as the vulnerability assessment. So thanks, I went a little bit over time, I think, but thanks, I'm happy to take questions and, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Grant and Andrea for hosting this session as well. Thanks, Jeff. So I've still got a, a few minutes for questions. If anybody wants to throw anything into, uh, so we have our Q&A box there. I, don't have, I do not have that open. Oh, there we go. It's coming in. So we got, we got one from Dan Palombi from, uh, from Alberta. So to take to undertake aquifer delineation in permafrost regions, have you considered challenges and opportunities using airborne or ground-based geophysical methods in light of the paucity of subsurface data in these regions? Excellent presentation. So thanks for your question and comment, Dan. Um, any thoughts on that, Jeff? Yeah, this is a good question. There has been some work that's been done. I mean, geophysics, and I've done no shortage of geophysics in my life, and I always feel like I'm never quite satisfied with the answer at the end of the day. Um, you know, it always sort of feels like a very non-unique study. I think some, there's actually been some really, really cool work done by the group at the U.S. Geological Survey, Michelle Walver, Walverd and um, Rob Striegel did some really cool stuff in the Yukon Flats, where they actually flew airborne mm -hmm. geophysics, and it was like the ideal site because it was entirely sand. <laughs> It's all the wind blowing, you know, frozen lows, you know, and then they did this great geophysics and they can actually really well map out talux below lakes and some other really cool stuff. And I think that site is one of the projects that I'm always sort of jealous of. I'm like, man, that was some of the coolest geophysics. I think geophysics gets more complicated, especially, you know, trying to delineate the, the frozen versus unfrozen in, you know, places that have heterogeneous geology, I think creates some challenges, but there definitely is some opportunities. I'm not saying we do it. I mean, we try to do it. We do it poorly, but we do try to do, you know, you know land-based geophysics, you know, driving around in the snow, you know, dragging around GPR units and stuff. So yeah, so I think there is some opportunities there. Um, but I think also there does need to be some wells, you know, there needs to be some ground truthing and so on of these projects. And that's one of the, the challenges, I think. Worth knowing the Yukon now, if we're going to say this in my talk, Yukon now has 57 groundwater monitoring wells and each year is drilling more. And so they're sort of trying to put these in critical locations to actually do some ground truthing of their aquifer mapping projects. Yeah, that's really impressive. That's catching up to some problems is probably exceeding a few small ones, so. Yeah. So, so just, yeah, so uh, a quick comment uh, in the, oh, we got a quick comment from, from Brendan Mulligan, uh, so people can check that out. So I'd love for someone to support our aquifer mapping with geophysics, discuss this with the GSC and academics, can you apply geophysics to map, mapping proven aquifers in the Yukon? So if we do know anybody doing geophysics, we'll put them in touch with, with Brendan. So uh, yeah, yeah so, so thanks, Jeff. I think we'll move on to uh, our next talk, which you've almost already sort of introduced. So we have uh, Elliot Skirsan from, uh, I guess, U of S these days, although I don't know if you've ever actually made it to, to Saskatoon yet. Um, <laughs> assessing groundwater vulnerability to geogenic contamination in permafrost regions. So take it away, Elliot. Thank you, Grant. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're good to go. Good stuff. And, and thank you, Jeff, for the great introductory talk on uh, northern hydrogeology. I was going to begin my introduction. This is a five-minute session, so it's quick on uh, a note that the abstract actually talked about a lot a lot about changes in groundwater flow but there was nothing about groundwater quality in there uh, thankfully uh, Jeff McKenzie did a great job of introducing the fact that we might also expect some changes in groundwater chemistry as uh, these thawing processes in the north happen and that's uh that's the title of my talk which is a which is a question because we're really just starting this project I arrived at the U of S and I am here in Saskatoon Grant um, in February of this year to start this project and we're asking, does the thaw of permafrost and warming temperatures in the north increase the potential for release of geogenic contaminants? When I say geogenic contaminants, I'm talking about mostly trace metals that are naturally occurring in rock um, and that can be present at levels that are of concern for water users. So um, 
Canada and the North are permafrost uh, countries, if you if you look at a map and, and you've seen some of these previously. And uh, I've got a bit of a different number here. My number is 97% of Yukoners use groundwater for water supply. Uh, Jeff said 99. So regardless, it's uh, almost everybody in, in Yukon that uses groundwater as a, as a drinking water source. And under present day conditions, there's already been a couple news headlines. There are a few communities where this is actually already an issue. Um, so some communities have had to abandon uh, water supply wells because they've had uranium or arsenic issues. And then there are a number of communities that need to treat the water um, before it's safe for use. And of course that comes at a, a pretty high cost. Here's a little map of uranium in surface water. So if you think of uranium in surface water, it, it's kind of a diluted expression of a groundwater signature. And I flagged all those red dots are concentrations that exceed aquatic life guidelines. Um, the gray dots of which there are tens of thousands are below um, you know, tra trace levels, essentially not of concern. Um, oh, and just, the, just jump in here. We can't see your slides. Oh, you can't see any of my slides. Oh. Maybe I should share my screen. <laughs> <laughs> I should have jumped in earlier there. Uh, hang on. Sorry about that, everybody. Your, the description was so good until you were <laughs> talking about this map. So. Okay. Um, well, you missed all my pretty pictures. I guess that's uh, that's the consequence of being new at these virtual conferences, huh? Okay. Are you seeing the map now? We're good, yeah. Okay, thank you, carrying on. So on this map, all the red dots are uh, hits of uranium that are near or above uh, guideline values. And I've used these uh, stars to show either communities or mining sites um, that have issues with uranium and arsenic, to my knowledge, in groundwater. So um, it is something that is uh, already concerning at the territorial level. And the big question we're asking here can you see my, my question at the top here, or is it blocked by the Zoom bar? Oh, I can see it. We're good. Okay, I can't. Okay. Anyways, uh, so I'm asking, is this going to get worse? So we have uh, permafrost in the subsurface here. And if we think of permafrost chemically, it's essentially a mixture of uh, you know ice, frozen rock, minerals, and frozen organic matter. So on a very basic level, if we think of um, once the rock thaws it and uh, the water that's in contact with the rock thaws, it allows chemical reactions to occur and uh, potentially release of whatever those rocks contain. And the um, thaw of organic matter allows it to be um, degraded by bacteria, which in, in many ways changes groundwater chemistry with unknown effects on um, trace metals. So the hypotheses that we're setting forth as we, as we get started on this project, um, first off, just very simple that water temperatures increases weathering of, of rock and increases availability of organic carbon to degradation. And if we get thinking more about the geochemistry of the system, so organic carbon can do a lot of things. Um, first, there's direct um, complexation reactions with trace metals that can potentially lead to release of trace metals that are present in aquifer matrix. And um, globally, arsenic is an issue in a lot of places in groundwater. And pretty commonly, it occurs in low redox conditions where we get a shift towards more reducing conditions. And that's commonly associated with organic carbon. For um, As we release um, solutes from rocks, we also get potential increases in um, dissolved CO2 and major ion concentrations, which also can complex metals. And that's a big part of uranium mobility. And so the effects on uranium are really uncertain at this point. In uh, low redox conditions, uranium tends to be insoluble, but the solubility can also be enhanced when we have lots of major ions in solution. So which direction it goes, we don't quite know yet. So here's a bit of an overview of um, our approach to, to get started on this. Um, so. Jeff already introduced the, the large number of monitoring wells that are available in Yukon. So we're compiling a data set of groundwater quality across the territory to get a sense of present day conditions. And then at a couple of sites, we're looking at targeted uh, permafrost coring and geochemical analyses to look at the solid phase and really what are the phases of uranium and arsenic in, um, in the ground. And we're going to be doing some lab experiments where we basically heat that stuff up and look at the chemical evolution in um, under warmer conditions. And bringing all this information together is gonna to get a sense of where we're at uh, present day and then where we, where we might think things might go as uh, temperatures warm and some of these geochemical processes uh, start to unfold. So um, just the last little slide here, the implications. Well, first off, it's just increased awareness. I think we're, we're starting to become aware that this, this is an issue and there are probably thousands of uh, private domestic wells across Yukon as well as public uh, supply wells and 
um, we want to get a sense for, you know, is it an issue that we should be paying attention to? Potential risk factors within a certain um, uh, aquifer that might make it more or less prone to uh, geogenic contamination. And um, we want to be able to anticipate potential changes in water quality as the, the um, warming climate leads to all of these uh, changes. So last little slide is the people involved. So on the left, um, so I'm a postdoc here at USASC and we have Matt Felwak and Anna Grunsky who are starting their masters at USASC and McMaster respectively. And then the profs involved include uh, Matt Lindsay and Grant Ferguson here at USASC and Sean Carey at McMaster. And I think we've got Brendan Mulligan in, in the audience. So Grand, uh, Brendan is uh, the hydrogeologist, hydrogeologist at Yukon government and his colleagues at Water Resources are helping us out um, in this project. So that's, uh, that, that's the lightning session. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. So we've got a few minutes for uh, questions here. Not much coming up. So Elliot, I mean, I guess I'll ask a quick question here. So are there any clues from other regions, right? So as things warm in the Yukon, are there other areas, maybe just slightly to the south that would have seen more activation or, or clues to what we might see or other analogs? I think it's actually fairly novel, these, the ideas we have. I, there, there's a little bit of work that's been done in, in Siberia, just kind of permafrost and metal mobilization. And so there's some literature there that um, has shown potential releases of organic carbon and uh, complexation with metals. Um, to be honest, there's not a lot out there, um, which is, I think, one of the exciting things about this work. So um, it'll be interesting to see what, what we get. Still watching the chat here. If anybody else on the panel wants to jump in. Yeah, I think you are kind of onto something here. It is kind of the, a unique situation, right? Just given kind of where Yukon sits and there is this reliance and I know from some of Jeff's work and other things I've seen, right? The, the ter Northwest Territory is kind of opposite, right? More reliant on, on surface water, right? So. But obviously, I mean, there's going to be connections there too as we start to see more base flow and you know what are the potential kind of ecosystems and surface water knock-on effects. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you know one of the one of the sites that I'm aware of too, or, or you know, you asked if there's any um, evidence right now that these processes are happening, and I have heard of a couple of of mine sites that are in exploration stages uh, in Yukon where um, they've seen um, relationships between flow and organic carbon and, and arsenic and some of the data that I have on some of the field sites also show that there is definitely a lot of organic carbon in the active zone. And that's also where I think we get arsenic coming off. So um, I think, you know, we're still very early in this, but I think there's enough there to, to motivate doing more. Okay, one quick one, and this is all feeling a little bit twisted together because this is from Matt Lindsay. Um, so Ellie, can you comment on what we know about the geochemical processes in non-permafrost regions and how this supported your hypothesis development? So quick answer and then we'll get on to Aiden. That's like a thesis defense question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer it very quickly. I mean, we're, we're not doing anything groundbreaking in terms of um, relationships between the major factors that control trace metals. And, and so those are things like pH, redox, complexation, sorption, all these things are fairly, you know, well understood um, in warmer regions, but what's not known is how these processes are, gonna, are going to evolve in northern environments. And we know enough now in northern environments to say that we are expecting release of organic carbon. I think it's reasonable to expect increased weathering rates of rocks just because things used to be frozen and now there's the huge temperature depends, dependency in chemical reactions. So the very short answer is that we're applying things that are have been determined under warm conditions to cold environments and um, that hasn't been done, but it, it should be done. Great, thanks. <laughs> so Matt says that was the answer I was looking for, great. Okay, so thanks Elliot. And we'll move on to uh, Aiden Mowat. So, I guess sticking with a, a cold regions theme coming slightly to the south and east here to Saskatchewan, but back in time to when it was uh, maybe as cold or colder than the Yukon. So, 
Take it away. All right. Um, share my screen. Uh, do you guys see it? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Okay. Screen, yeah. We can still see your preview thing on this side, but yeah. Okay. Good. Um, all right. Well, perfect. Uh, Elliot, great talk. I, I was just prepared to listen to you for five minutes talking to us, um, honestly. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you everyone for joining in uh, for my talk today. Uh, yeah, switching it up a little bit, not talking about permafrost, but I will be presenting the results of some of my PhD studies uh, titled the Pleistocene Meltwater Recharge to Regional Aquifers. So deep groundwater and sedimentary basins have been profoundly impacted by glacial events. Uh, glac glacial cycles have covered North America and the Northern Hemisphere over the last two million years. And between the advance and retreat of these glaciers resulted in meltwater influx into the permeable formations. As we can see in this figure, many sedimentary basins across North America have these anomalous total dissolved solid concentrations and paired with abnormal geochemical signatures tells us that there's more than just a paleo evaporated seawater preserved deep in the basins. But when did this occur? What was the effect? Why do we care? So my research deals with the geochemical systems, uh, but the infiltration of meltwaters has also uh, implications on freshwater resources and influences the mineral and resource industry. So determining the timing and flow paths of this recharge contributes a very vital narrative to for sedimentary basins. So my research focuses on the Western Canada sedimentary basin and in particular the Williston Basin. Um, so how can glacial meltwaters reach depths of 1.5 kilometers, maybe even deeper? Wouldn't deep groundwater like this just be old seawater? Well, we saw from the figure before that the simple answer is no. Um, but at one point, sure, there was probably just this old seawater source with organized flow between the south to the north or A to A prime here. Uh, but the effect of glaciers has profoundly impacted the composition of groundwater and resulted in this reorganization from the northern margin or A prime very deep into the Williston Basin while it was under massive increases in hydraulic heads from the glacier. Now, I focus mostly on this mixing zone, the green area. Um, I've included a cross section here on the right side. Um, the formations I'm looking at are the mid to upper Devonian. And this section is bound by the aquaclude in the lower portion and then sandstone and shale beds at the top. So it's here where I'm concerned about whether these aquifers, there's several aquifers and aquitards layered, uh, whether they're acting uniformly or as one thick unit or maybe if the mixing zone has been totally overprinted over time to gain a more basinal perspective of the continental scale groundwater flow in the Williston Basin as it's been impacted by um, the Pleistocene glacial cycles. So right away, we observe that carbonate aquifers and aquitards are geochemically distinct. And this is indicative of a mixed Pleistocene recharge source coexisting with the paleoevaporative brine. So first, oxygen and deuterium data for the deep aquifers in the Williston Basin plot much more depleted than modern precipitation along the global meteoric waterline. And second, these aquifers also consist of extremely high chlorine to bromine molar values that are indicative of salt dissolution, while the aqu aquitards are less impacted with low chlorine to bromine values. Now, as a hydrogeologist, hydrologist, hydrogeochemist, I think we can all agree that when we have good data and a model that could be applicable to our research, we now have a pretty cool tool to understand some groundwater. And here I want to date and understand the preservation of it in the Williston Basin. So by combining the computer transport model and the known stable isotope concentration data to do this kind of alternative dating technique, we can determine the age of arrival of the groundwater or the recharge to the region. Without going into details, basically what I've done is imparted a fixed boundary condition at the top of the strat column, the bottom at the aquaclude, and then assumed complete replacement in each aquifer with meltwater, and then observed the transport into the over and underlying aquitards over time. And what we find is that one, we can confidently say that the stacked aquifers do respond differently and do not act as a single large aquifer unit. Um, the arrival to the region occurred at either 75 to 150,000 years ago or 300 to 500,000 years ago. 
Two, what we can also conclude is that there's been a delay in the groundwater arrival, but what we cannot conclude from this particular style of model is why that's happened. So whether it's probably an impact of permeability, maybe different outcrop locations or representing the arrival of different glacial cycles altogether. Now, in conclusion for the Williston Basin, it does appear that we have excellent preservation of Pleistocene meltwater in the Paleozoic aquifers, which means um, these impacted basins are still responding to the last glaciation. Now, when we compare spatially, we can also now project points of recharge and flow paths that have occurred along the northern margin, as well as the previously identified recharge zones um, in the northeast. And overall, these results contribute to the paleo reconstruction of groundwater movement in the Williston Basin. The implications of this research uh, with this combined approach, it goes beyond a single confined aquifer unit, uh, really anywhere with defined boundary conditions. Um, these high density profiles are complementary to other dating techniques, uh, but unfortunately typically have low density data. Um, and that pl since Pleistocene meltwater is such an important freshwater resource and influences the energy and mineral resources, um, it's a really important uh, takeaway from this for to consider for research and proposals in those fields of study. And that is it. Thanks, Aiden. Yeah. Not sure. Oh, we got questions coming in. Good. So I think oh. I've asked you enough questions. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> so we have from anonymous attendee, what type of aquifer does glacial till create in this region? I mean, unconfined, confined, leaky. So I think, I think you can cover that off, Aiden. Yeah. These deep confined aquifers versus the, the tills. So. Yeah. So the glacial till in this case is basically just um, it, it, is such a small portion of the model. I think it's about 11 meters compared to uh, like over a kilometer depth um, that I just have it as a um, infiltration part for the model and not actually like a fully co confined or unconfined aquifer in there. Just the scale of this is, uh, I can't put those types of details in. And also these aquifers are so disconnected from from the surficial water that uh, it likely would not have any connection at all anyway. Any other questions for Aiden? Like I said, I could ask Aiden questions, but I've been mm. asking Aiden questions for quite a while. Elliot says, how deep did Pleistocene recharge reach in this region? So I'm looking at regions that are more than a kilometer depth. Um, the lowest that I'm looking at is about um, 1100 meters below the surface. So, um, but it also goes beyond what I'm looking at, which only gets deeper into the basin. I would say close to 1.5 um, in the uh, Devonian region, the, the Devonian formations at least probably 1.5 kilometers. But I know that there is, uh, note of it in the even deeper formations as well. Yeah, it's one final question here before we move on to Blake. Uh, so is, do you plan on comparing uh, and other basins to see if there's similar results? But maybe in that context, you could, you know, so what others to so say, say what your co-advisor, Jen McIntosh, has found in other basins, right? So. Yeah, so this this has been uh, researched in other basins as well. This uh, this particular model had not uh, has not been applied, but um, this uh, phenomenon of, of glacial meltwater in really deep in these basins um, has been very well studied uh, for the last about 20 years, 20, 30 years. One more before we move on to Blake, this, this is a good one. So Dan Palombi who spent a lot of time thinking about these uh, aquifers. So missed whether your modeling includes Mississippian aquifers. If so, any comments on how you intend to represent petroleum systems? Hmm. Uh, the modeling does not include Mississippian aquifers. Um, and I don't think I can comment on how on the petroleum system aspect, but it's definitely uh, something to consider uh, if, I, if I choose to add in other aquifers. Yeah, I, th I think you'd probably need data a little bit further to the to the south, deeper into the basin, mm -hmm. right? Because we're working with all the potash 
mines more yeah. or less where we don't really see a whole lot of petroleum. But, but yeah, interesting point. Yeah, it'd be fun to look and tie this back into your research a little bit more. Yeah. Though. Okay, thanks, Aiden. So we'll move yeah, on to Blake. You. We're a minute behind here, but uh, pick up some as we go. So we have Blake, and Blake's going to talk to us about the intermediate zone, which is uh, our zone between uh, oil and gas producing that, that uh, Dan mentioned, and uh, our freshwater aquifers up top, so that interface. So I'll leave it to you, Blake. So hi everybody, my name is Blake Warnick and I'm a master's student at the University of Saskatchewan and I'll be presenting on groundwater flow across the intermediate zone. First off, I'm just going to thank my co-supervisors on this project, Dr. Grant Ferguson from the University of Saskatchewan and Dr. Jennifer McIntosh from the University of Arizona. So the importance of the intermediate zone. So essentially like what is the intermediate zone? Well, as Grant sort of mentioned just before the presentation, it's the zone that separates the deeper oil and gas regions from our shallow freshwater aquifers. Um, the intermediate zone essentially acts as a buffer between the two zones that fluids would have to flow through to get to one another and it's highlighted here on the screen here in this figure. Um, there's little that's known about the intermediate zone and its water qualities. So it is possible that through overpressuring from injecting of produced fluids into the deeper zones that you could have migration through the intermediate zone and into the shallow freshwater aquifers above. So for this study here highlighted in the red box is the area that I'll be looking at and this encompasses Saskatchewan's oil and gas region, which is part of the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. From the figure here, we can see that it's home to a number of unconventional oil and gas reservoirs, but this area is also home to numerous conventional oil and gas reservoirs as well. So next I have a stratigraphical column and unlike Aiden's, this isn't as nice. It's for visual purposes only as it's not to scale and it's missing some formations, but I just wanted to give people an idea of sort of what we're looking at here in the study area. So just as a jumping off point at the bottom, we have the prairie evaporite, which is home to the potash formations in the province. Moving up, we go through the Manitoba and Saskatchewan groups, and then we get into the big oil and gas areas in the province, the producing formation. So that would be what we would consider like the deeper zone. So we have the Bakken formation, the Madison group, which is home to the Mydale formation, the Shaunavan formation, and then the Manville group. Above the Manville group, we have the intermediate zone. This intermediate zone is mainly made up of shales, but there are some sandstones in there, which we see with the Viking formation, which is in the intermediate zone, but it is an oil and gas producer. Above the intermediate zone, we have the Belly River formation. This formation is not widely used as a water source, but in some areas it is. So for this, we're gonna consider this to sort of be the deepest shallow freshwater aquifer. So talking about the Manville group here, we have sort of an overview of the Manville waters. So the Manville has been used as a disposal formation to inject um, produced saline fluids in for a number of years. Over on the right, we sort of have like a water balance. So in the dark blue, we have water that has been um, injected into the Manville formation. And in the light blue, we have water that has been produced. So that leaves us with that red sort of block, which is an excess of 262 million meters cubed of water that has been injected into the Manville Formation that wasn't there before. So it is this water that could possibly cause overpressuring in some areas of the Manville Group that could lead to gradients that would force waters upward into the intermediate zone, which would then force those waters that we don't know too much about in the intermediate zone to possibly discharge into shallow freshwater aquifers above. And then on the left here, we just have a figure of total dissolved solids from wells in the Manville group that have data for. Um, and we can see that all the values are over 2000 parts per million. So this could be a problem because the USGS defines um, freshwater as having less than 1000 parts per million. So like I said, this water, if it were to make it into our freshwater, shallow aquifers could be problematic. 
Um, next here, we're going to look at this vertical hydraulic gradient map of the intermediate zone. So it can be seen that down in the Weyburn area here, which is southeast of Regina, we have a higher upward hydraulic gradient. So this upward hydraulic gradient could allow for fluids to move faster upwards through the intermediate zone, pushing fluids into the shallow freshwater aquifers and causing possible contamination issues. So after doing some quick Darcy's law estimations, you can sort of see my data ranges for permeability, porosity, differences in delta H and delta L. Uh, it was estimated that the velocity of this fluid would be anywhere from 2.7 times 10 to the negative 8 meters per year to 0 0.142 meters per year. That then converts into a transit time of 775 years to 740 million years. So as you can sort of see, this isn't really like a today issue. It'll definitely be a legacy contamination issue. So then just to conclude in this quick lightning talk, based on Darcy's law estimations, it doesn't, does not appear that produced water injected into the Manville Formation could migrate into the shallow freshwater aquifers above without the presence of geological features that are highly permeable or leaky well casing. So thanks everybody for listening today. Thanks, Blake. Good uh, overview of kind of the early, early uh, parts of your research. So uh, do you have questions here? What tool did you use to plot the vertical hydraulic gradient plot? So you want to explain, I guess, how you did that, Blake? Yeah, so the tool that I used, I ended up using Surfer, but the, the data that I put into Surfer was I based off of differences from hydraulic heads in the Manville Formation where all the injection is happening compared to the water tables in Saskatchewan. And then I took the difference there and I got the, the vertical hydraulic gradients from that. Yeah, again, kind of awkward here doing this for my own students and peppered Blake with questions over the years. So, but uh, yeah, so maybe, maybe I'll flip I it see over. see that Elliot has a question here. Elliot oh, was does. asking, oh, yeah, so you mentioned leaky well casing. Do we have enough data to rule out potential increased connectivity due to oil and gas or deep water wells? I haven't like truly looked a lot into the leaky wells yet. This is sort of just early like data so far, but I would sort of say, I don't know, that'd be hard to just based on the number of leaky wells that Saskatchewan does have, that would be a lot of work to look into. So I'd have to definitely narrow it down to smaller zones and just sort of say out of those zones. Excellent, yeah. and there's one more question that came in um, from Jeff also on the panel. Are there faults or fractures that could allow for enhanced vertical flow? Uh, yeah, there's definitely faults or fractures that could, but I think these would be more um, localized features, like you're not going to see them over a, a super long region. And I think the shales would mostly like help that or help suppress that enough that it would still take a long time that you're, it would be more of a legacy issue. Excellent. Now, Grant, you can ask your question if you want. I said, I've asked Blake enough questions, so I'm glad that, that Jeff and Elliot jumped in. Yeah, so Excellent. that was kind of a nice way of having the transition come through. So I'll turn it over to Andrea for the rest of the session. Thanks, Blake. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Blake. All right. And uh, moving on, our next speaker is Xing Tong, and she is a PhD student at the University of Waterloo working with Walter Elman. And she will talk to us about the significance of groundwater dynamics within hydrologic models. So I'll pass it off to Xing. Yeah, great. So good afternoon, everyone. And today, my uh, I will talk about the um, my research is about significance of groundwater dynamics within hydrologic models. So everyone can see my slides. Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, I'll get started. So our research is try to examine the significance of shallow deep groundwater flow on surface water flow 
prediction using the uh, hydrogeosphere HDS, which is a fully integrated hydrological model. So we are trying to investigate spatial and temporal variations in surface water and groundwater flux, and also try to examine the impacts of climate change, winter process, and also human activities on surface water and groundwater interaction. So our study area is Elder Creek Watershed, which is part of the Grand River Watershed in Southern Ontario. So Elder Creek Watershed is underlain by Waterloo Marine, which is considered to be highly heterogeneous. And the surface and subsurface heterogeneity in hydrological uh, parameters are thought to greatly impact on surface water groundwater interaction. So we have developed a full HGS model to examine this issue. Uh, so model one is just a 2D sufficient layer without considering the subsurface. Model two is the sufficient layer underlain by a one meter deep soil layer. The model three is a sufficient layer with a thick subsurface consisting of uniform and isotropic hydrologic hydraulic parameter. And model four, the subsurface consisting of detailed hydrostratigraphy. So for, for all the models, model one to model four, we have generated 2D triangular mesh and applied it to the HGS. And also we have applied seven different land use type defined uh, on the sufficient layer. And in Elder Creek watershed, agricultural land is dominated. For model two, three, and four, we have assigned the soil type um, based on the sand seal clay percentage. And for model three and four, we applied the geological, the geological model, which is from the original of Waterloo tier three assessment, which is a FIFLO model. So uh, for the FIFLO model, we only select and use the top 10 layers and, and also include the upper aquifer, aquifer one, which including AFB one and AFB two, which is the main pumping aquifer within the study area. So before the transient simulation, we first let the model to run on the steady state uh, with a long-term average climate forcing about 10 years to equilibrium the subsurface. Then the result of it is used as the initial condition for the transient simulation. The transient simulation is first run from spring to fall, and then by adding the winter process and essential parameters, we simulate and uh, estimated the um, discharge over the winter time. So the daily weather data from Rossville weather station is used while the simulated discharge is compared with the observed discharge at three gauging stations, including Shady Brook, New Dundee, and Bethel. But only the New Dundee station have continuously daily observed discharge. So this gives us the most detailed uh, comparison between the simulated and observed discharge. So let's look at the model one to four comparison. So we compare the result from model one to model four and also the observed discharge. We find that from upstream to downstream, which is from Shady Brook to Bethel, the value, the discharge value significantly increases. And also the model one and model two, which show in black and orange color is dramatically larger than the model three and the model four result and also the observed discharge. So the model four with the most detailed representation of the subsurface fits best to the observed discharge. So for the winter time, the results quite similar with the uh, results from spring to fall, while model four yields the best results compared with the this observed discharge. If we take a look at the exchange flux along the stream during the simulation period, we find that the groundwater is discharging to the surface water, mostly at the main channel, while the groundwater is recharging mainly at some stream ridges. So the precipitation events dramatically affect the groundwater recharge, while the groundwater discharge tends to stay constant during the simulation period. So because there are seven well fill located within the Outer Creek, so we performed the simulations with two pumping locations, W7 and K26, to see the effect of the uh, municipal well operation. So the overall, then we plot the hydraulic head along this two cross section to look at the result of it. 
the overall head at W7 is generally higher than the K26, which matches with the previous report that groundwater generally flow from Northwest to Southeast. In the vertical direction, the drawdown both affecting the surface and the bottom layer of the domain. It is also noticed that if we take a look at the, of the C K26, the stream close to K26 form a small drawdown cone, which indicate that groundwater is recharging the stream. So we would assume that continuous pumping of K26 will greatly affect the east side of the drawdown cone of the stream. So to conclude, overall, we find that result from model one to four with virus conceptualization of how the subsurface is treated suggests that groundwater flow and subsurface characterization have both great impact on the surface water flow. While model one and two yields significantly larger value at all three gauging station, model four with most detailed representation of the subsurface fit best to the observed discharge data. So ongoing work will involve in the calibration of models um, to, met, to achieve bet, better matches to the observe the groundwater levels and also to measure the stream flow rates. So we hope that the model we developed can be served as a reference to further analyze the impact of human activity in both groundwater and surface water and also contaminant transport and the winter process at the watershed scale. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shin. So we'll give a couple of minutes to have questions come in. Um, that's really exciting work, as you may be familiar. I'm familiar with how to geosphere as well. So I actually have a question uh, to abide the time while we wait for other questions. So between all of your different models mm -hmm. um, with different characterizations, did you have the same number of parameters you were calibrating, or were you calibrating more parameters in the one with more detail? Yeah, I would say that uh, like the model with more details about subsurface will have more parameters to be calibrated. For example, model one only have like a 2D sufficient layer, so it doesn't have any parameter related to the subsurface. For example, uh, hydraulic conductivity or specific st storage. So I would say like with the increases detailed representation of subsurface, there are more parameters can be used and calibrated. And we assume that this like increased number of parameters can give us like better match to the observed discharge. Excellent. And then I guess following on that, did you use was it manually calibrated or did you use the pest that's coupled with how did you? Yeah, it? yeah, we're trying to use the uh, the the, the uh, pest and also like the yeah mainly pest. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, while we wait for other questions, how were the run times? compared between the, obviously it's gonna take longer to go through more detail, but was it something where it was an exponential increase? Yeah, I would say it's like an exponential increase because for like the model one, the 2D official, we only have like overland hydraulic parameters to use. So it's relatively very quick, but as we like embedded more like parameters, the runtime is like increased exp expansionally. All right, and then I'll have one last question here. <laughs> Sorry, I have a lot of questions on this topic. Yeah. Is there any consideration to sort of how uncertainty plays out, right? Like when we're in a simpler model, we may be a little bit more certain about the parameters we're putting in. And as we get it more detailed, it gets a little cloudier. Is that any part of the consideration or not at this point? Yeah, not at this point, but it definitely will be considered like in our next dive, like study. Yeah. But it's a really good question. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. That was a great presentation. And uh, we will move on and try to stay on schedule here. So our next presenter is uh, Beth Kadu Georgis, and I apologize for probably not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, and Dr. Beth Kadu Georgis, he's a postdoc at University of Saskatchewan. He's working with uh, both Helen Bosch and um, Howard Weider. And I'm going to pass it off to him to talk about uh, process sequence and parameter identification, groundwater representation, and predictive uncertainty. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. My name is Bafagadu, and I'll be talking about 
impacts of process sequence and parameter identification, groundwater representation, and predictive uncertainty in conceptual hydrological models. I'll start with a quick overview of how HYPE simulates different fluxes, and then I will uh, compare uh, model response behaviors for different uh, solution schemes in HYPE. Um, uh, I was to present the parameter inference comparison as well, but I don't think I will have enough time for that, so I'm going to skip this part. And the uh, other part is base flow comparison using two case studies. So the HYPE model calculates fluxes sequentially. It calculates percolation first, adjusts the storage, calculates evapotranspiration, adjusts the storage, and then calculates interflow. So because of um, this sequential calculation nature, it always puts more emphasis on the percolation simulation. And most of the time, interflow is under simulated, or even sometimes uh, zero values are simulated in row. So the, the objective of my research is actually to examine the limitations of uh, this sequential calculation, which is widely used in many conceptual hydrological models. I have reviewed uh, source code of SWAT, HDV, uh, and other uh, conceptual hydrological models. So in one way or another, they are using sequential calculation schemes. So the objective is examining the limitations um, by implementing a continuous state space formulation uh, and using uh, implicit numerical solvers. So I'm going to compare the results of the sequential calculation flux of HYPE with a, a more um, uh, numerically uh, accurate solution of the state space formulation using different experiments. And the other objective is also to come up with a simplified method of uh, emulating the results of uh, the implicit solution of the state space formulation because of uh, the computational issues for large scale applications and for um, long time uh, series, as well as for multiple model runs, uh, implicit solutions of the state space formulation are uh, always computationally demanding. So the other uh, scheme I uh, we introduced in this study is the LNR3 method, which uh, is completely using a different approach with regard to calculating fluxes. Rather than calculating the fluxes sequentially, it calculates the total flux first as a function of the storage at the beginning of the time step and the reservoir constants of each fluxes. Once the total, once the total flux is calculated, it apportions uh, the total flux into the different uh, subfluxes using the reservoir constant as weights. So that's the basic technique the LN and LNR3 is using to emulate the results of the implicit solution of state space formulation. So the steady areas I am going to use for uh, the real case application are the beaver watershed in the Lake Simcoe Basin and the Red Asinaboin River Basin. I'm going to present um, one experimental uh, comparison only. It will uh, definitely give um, a good uh, picture of how the sequential calculation can be limited, limited in terms of um, making the results of the implicit solution of state space formulation. So here I'm comparing the daily uh, uh, storage versus fluxes curve and the hourly storage versus fluxes curve. So here the different colors represent the percolation, the evapotranspiration, and the yellow color here represents the horizontal flux or the interflow. What we can see from uh, the comparison of the daily and hourly computation using the default sequential uh, solution scheme of HYPE is uh, the daily time step doesn't simulate uh, interflow at all, whereas the hourly computation time step simulates uh, significant interflow. And it's comparison with the implicit solution of the state space formulation in HYPE shows that the daily simulation actually gives equal magnitudes of interflow and uh, percolation for this particular uh, experiment. And the default type is highly underestimating the interflow because of the sequential calculation. The other aspect we see is uh, this is the sequential uh, solution applied to the state sp space formulation, not the original uh, sequential solution the hype uses. 
it uses the same technique but applied to the set test formulation. So we see the same uh, uh, signature with regard to the interflow simulation. We don't see any interflow at the daily time step, whereas it simulates exact same, almost exact same um, storage versus flux curve uh, at the hourly time step. Uh, one aspect that we can note from uh, this comparison is the interflow is initiated at a delayed storage uh, simply because of uh, the sequential calculation of the sequential calculation of the fluxes. So what we learn from this comparison is at a coarser time step, which is basically the standard time step hypothesis. Uh, uh, that's a daily time step. It's, it's really underestimating the interflow for this particular experiment. I have run uh, many other experiments and similar characteristics uh, were observed. With regard to the LNR3 method, the simplified method we introduced, it, uh, it mimics uh, response behavior of the implicit state space formulation as a daily time step. It did the same, um, it provides the same storage versus uh, flux curves at the hourly time step as well. Here we see a slightly different uh, curve simply because uh, by comparing the hourly and the daily uh, curves of the implicit state space formulation, we learned that uh, because of the inconsistency of uh, primary units, transforming daily primary values into hourly time step uh, introduce some bias. So the LNR3 method I'm presenting for the hourly time step is actually modified to address this issue. So we see the same magnitude of uh, interflow and percolation simulated at the hourly time step as well. So we can easily replicate what the implicit state space formulation simulates using uh, this kind of uh, simplified method while maintaining the computational speed of the sequential calculation scheme. Uh, I'm going to skip the primary inference comparison. So regarding the groundwater contribution, actually I used the uh, formal likelihood Bayesian method to infer the parameters and use the posterior distribution of the parameters to, to, run, the, uh, to run the model and uh, uh, draw the distribution of the groundwater contribution. So we see for the beaver model, the default type is providing around 93% of uh, the ground order to be contributed in the stream flow, whereas the literature shows uh, this region has 60 up to 80% of groundwater contribution. So we see an overestimation. The same uh, overestimation was observed when the sequential state space formulation was implemented, I mean, was run for this case study. Uh, whereas for the uh, LNR3 method, we see that the groundwater contribution is well in the range of the literature value for the basin. For the Red Assiniboine River basin, um, we even see more overestimation for the default type and the sequential state space formulation. We still see very high uh, percentage of stream flow contributed by the groundwater. And this is uh, typically because of the sequential calculation nature, which emphasizes on the vertical flux calculation. And most of the time, uh, the storage uh, goes below the field capacity. So no uh, storage is available for the interflow simulation. That's what the experimental runs showed and the real case uh, simulations are also reflecting the same uh, signature. The LNR3 method, on the other hand, for the Red Assiniboine River Basin are simulating uh, 40 up to 60% of the stream flow to be contributed by the groundwater, which is much more in agreement with literature, which is, shows that uh, the groundwater contribution are around 50%. I also run um, a flow filtering tool to, to, to be sure about the groundwater contribution. So <clears throat> in, to wrap up, the sequential scheme uh, may provide unrealistic flow paths because of the sequential calculation nature, which emphasizes the flux that is calculated first. Uh, and the other aspect is the LNR3 method, which uh, we introduced emulates the results of the implicit solution of the state space formulation and improves the groundwater representation while uh, maintaining the computational efficiency of the default type. This aspect is actually 
critical when it comes to multiple model runs, such as sensitivity analysis, parameter uh, uncertainty analysis, uh, and uh, multiple model runs. And the LNR3 method can be implemented in other conceptual hydrological models as well. Thank you for listening, and uh, I'll be happy to answer your question. Hi, thank you. That was great. Um, we, in the interest of staying on time, if anyone has questions, please put them in the Q&A panel and we can have them answered there or you can just connect offline. But I have a really quick question, just the comparison between different methods between what Shin presented, which was these, you know, fully integrated models and yours. What are your run times when you say efficient? Are we talking seconds? Or yes. Minutes? To okay. run a, a single simulation, for instance, for 10 years period, it takes around 1.3 seconds for the sequential method as well as for the LNR3 method. But for the implicit method, it takes in minutes. So that's a big improvement in terms of computation time, emulating the result at a much lower computation time. Absolutely. All right, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. As I said, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A because we can answer those um, typing as well. All right, the uh, last presentation in this session is by Ethan McTavish. Uh, Ethan is a third year undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo, uh, working in earth and environmental sciences. He worked with me last term uh, in the winter as his first co-op student, uh, first co-op placement, both he and the other co-author, Lisa. And so he's gonna present the results of some of that work from last term. Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay. And you see it too? <laughs> can see that as well. All right, perfect. Let me just move this quick. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brookfield, for the introduction. So pretty much today, I'm going to share with you a look at baseload trends across Canada. So pretty much just to start off, like why is baseload important in the focus of our research? So groundwater makes up 90% of available usable freshwater worldwide, and is also important to communities, industry, and to all ecosystems. Um, across the world, there's an ever increasing need for freshwater um, as populations grow, agriculture use increases, and as the need uh, uh, and as the need increases, there's also a corresponding need to better understand base flow trends. Um, base flow is also the component of stream flow coming from groundwater. It is important to stream and ecosystem health and sustains stream flow during drought. Um, if base flow is changing, it's likely an indicator that groundwater is also changing. So pretty much what do we do? Well, Dr. Brookfield put us to work. Uh, she guided us to collect as much data related to stream flow depletion as we could, and then to organize that data. We then chose to focus on a method similar to that used by Dr. Ayers and her colleagues in analyzing monthly base flow um, across the US Midwest, and then applied that to stream flow here in Canada. So we ended up analyzing 968 stations across the country. Um, so we used the recursive base flow separation method that was developed by Lynn and Hollick to separate base flow from stream flow in all wells. And we also selected wells that had at least 50 years of continuous data. Um, and then rather than looking at annual base flow trends, we chose to look at monthly base flow averages. So in other words, we looked at like 50 year, or, uh, January over 50 years, February over 50 years, and so on. Um, and this kind of just makes it a lot easier to see seasonal variations in the data. Um, uh, and then after that, we decided we, we applied the Mankendall trend test, to the monthly base flow averages to determine if there was any like monotonic patterns in the data. Um, then we sorted the sites according to their p values being less than or equal to 0 0.05. And if a trend was present, we then looked at their tau values and just determined whether it was increasing or decreasing. So Base flow and the health of our groundwater are so important and yet very difficult to visualize. Visualize. So I've only just scratched the surface of this topic. So as I was collecting and organizing all this data, I wanted some way to visualize it so that I can make better sense of base flow trends. Uh, I need something that was really straightforward and super easy to interpret. So I asked myself, like, what is a good way to look at trends to understand them spatially so that it can be shown to others and clearly observed? Um, so I created this map, which hopefully opens. Um, just loading in, waking up. There might be a link in the chat too. It takes a little bit on the first startup. So pretty much, 
set that to base flow. So pretty much the green are increasing trends, the red are decreasing trends, and all the white dots are uh, no trend. So well, what do we find? Well, overall, we found there were more increasing than decreasing trends across all of Canada. Um, the only exceptions to this was found in PEI, uh, Nova Scotia, and on Vancouver Island, where more decreasing trends were observed. So if we take a closer look at um, Vancouver Island, um, you can see that for all months of the year, or almost all months of the year, there's more decreasing trends than increasing trends. And this is likely because um, just on islands, there's uh, groundwater is the main source of fresh water for the inhabitants just to do the limited amount of surface water. And the same can be seen in like on PEI, uh, where I believe 100% of uh, the, the water use is actually from groundwater. Um, and then as we uh, look at the prairies around here, um, I kind of anticipated that there would be more because we would see more decreasing trends because it's one of the um, like, I mean, it's a, uh, they have the most agriculture in Canada, um, especially during June and July, during the growing seasons. June and July, I thought I'd see a lot more decreasing trends, but overall, we still see a high amount of increasing trends. Um, this likely correlates with the fact that in this area, they still primarily use surface water for their crops. Um, I'd say the same is true for Southern Ontario and the Niagara region, another big area for farming. Um, and I mean, this might, this is likely to change in the future as like demands increase because of industry, agriculture and all that kind of stuff. And as uh, like, like climate change and stuff like that. So um, those are pretty much the main trends I just pulled out briefly. There's probably could talk about it for a really long time, but uh, pretty much what are we going to do next is pretty much continue to refine the methodology. And also I think it'd be really cool to look at precipitation and population density and vegetation and all that kind of stuff. And also to compare the uh, like these stations to a reference list of stations um, that uh, Professor Brookfield just brought to my attention yesterday that has actually like they're considered uh, free of human impact. So it'd be kind of interesting to compare like I don't know stations in uh, Waterloo to these like control stations and see if there's uh, big differences in base flow. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments at all? Thanks, Ethan. So there's one question coming through. Um, okay. If you can restate the period in which the trend was examined, what was the time period? Uh, it was over 50 years, but time period wise, it all kind of varies. Um, in the, like the refined, um, like when we refine it, it's we have to select like a actual uh, 50 year time frame and then apply that to all the sites, which will probably get rid of a lot of data points. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, but it's all 50 years of data at least. Um, and then another question coming in is, did you include or exclude regulated rivers? Um, it just pretty much every single stream flow gauge in Canada was analyzed. Um, so <laughs> whether there's uh, the regulated, whether there's dams, everything. Yeah. All right. And one other question was, what tool was used to create the map? Uh, this is shiny R. So just a little and leaflet actually, which is just a little like uh, R package that makes it really easy just to um, take data and just represent represent it on like visually and spatially and stuff like that. Yeah, it's really easy to use and kind of fun. I'm glad you found it fun. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I know. Yeah, and you. I do like that you're speaking as if you're not done yet because I'm. You didn't. You're not just done because I've stopped paying you for your co-ops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I need to find more co-ops. So <laughs> never know. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Is there any other questions coming in here? I like Grant. Don't really want to uh, question um, the students. Someone's working. asking access or asking if they can access it. So um, there should be a link. The only thing is, um, like, I can't pay for the server time. So like, I think I have um, like a max of like 25 hours or something of active uh, uh, like uptime. So you you can try and look at it, but it might get shut down <laughs> if it gets used a lot. Um, I, I also know that Professor. Brookfield has another student coming in that I think is going to like a grad student coming in that's going to like refine it and make it like more like better. So maybe maybe it will get put up again. I'm not sure. Yeah, Jim, the plan is so this work is going to is being continued by a master student that just started, Julian Murray. 
And the goal is, um, if you look, so Jesse Ayers works with uh, Gabrielle Villarini at Iowa, and she had a few papers come out recently that, um, that Ethan referenced. And we're going to first off mimic her approach with the idea of comparing US to Canada transboundary stuff to sort of see if we get consistent across there, which we should. And if we don't, that's interesting to find out why, but then also create something that we can put up more permanently. Um, so stay tuned for that. All right, thank you, Ethan. Yeah, thank you. All right, and so with that, we are actually almost right on time. Grant, it's like virtual high five. Look at us. <laughs> so I would like to thank all of our speakers. Thank you so much. I know Jeff had to go and, and do some chair duties, but I thank all of our speakers who were willing to come out and do this, especially on sort of a five minute time clock. We really appreciate it. They were all great talks, all really interesting about sort of the breadth of research that's going on with respect to groundwater in the, in the global water futures. Um, and thank you to all the attendees. I know we peaked out at about 40 people and considering the very other interesting sessions that were going on, I was really happy with that attendance. That's great to see such enthusiasm uh, for groundwater. And so uh, if anyone, we have a couple more minutes on the clock, we don't have to use them, but if anyone had any questions that they wanted to ask any of the uh, present presenters, you're more than welcome to throw them in. Otherwise, Grant and I can just sort of uh, discuss a little bit about some of the directions that we're taking with the global water futures with respect to groundwater. Um, Grant, if you want to discuss one of, some of your ongoing projects, and if I still have time, I can chat about some of the stuff we've just got going. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think this is really interesting because it kind of gives the breadth of everything that's going on with, with a few projects that are it's sort of winding up or morphing into other things and then future directions. So we saw the cold region stuff, deep hydrogeology, climate change in hydrogeology. So I, I guess that's kind of what's up next for, for Andrea and, and myself. Right? We're kicking off this, this project looking at you know climate change and, and groundwater, mostly focused in the prairies, just because that seemed like maybe there was an acute need, but certainly looking at, at broader scales, that would be great and interesting and uh and then obviously the the stuff that's ongoing in, in the north between uh jeff's work uh with, with dave rudolph and then some of the work that uh guess elliot is leading as a, as a postdoc with with matt Lindsay and myself and, and sean carey kind of working to support him in the background yeah so this is i had just started at waterloo last year so this is my first go around with uh, global water futures so i'm excited to get started on some of this stuff and to use some of the tools that we saw presented here. So hydrogeosphere, which Shin presented on is a tool that one of my grad students will be using as part of a global water futures project to simulate some of the aquifer systems in the prairies um, to sort of see uh, what the influence of, like Shin's looking at potential climate, but also what, what's gonna happen as we have these shifts in climate and changes, how we use water. What if we see a shift in irrigation from groundwater sources? Um, I moved here from Kansas where you know anything about aquifers, you know that they've depleted the crap out of a lot of the, <laughs> the aquifers there. Uh, and in sort of the rest of the Southwest, Arizona, where I know Grant does a lot of work in California. And so can we inform decisions so that we don't go down that path? Yeah, yeah. and another interesting question is kind of brought up today, you know, these, these quick simplistic models versus, you know, hydrogeosphere, the other end and other issues, you know, I've thought about and certainly comes up like, you know, do you, complexity, right? Like the sort of stuff that Aiden and Blake are looking at, which is you know, very important for, for some issues, but if we're going to get, say, the water budget right in the prairies, it's probably not that important, right? So, but where, where that stops, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question. So we are dealing with some fundamental hydrological issues here too. Absolutely. All right. Again, trying to keep us on time because there are, please, everybody pay attention to the um, schedule. There is other sessions going on after this. There's a panel discussion, so I encourage you to continue and uh, see the Global Water Futures meeting through to the end. So with that, uh, thank you, Grant, for co convening this with me. Thank you, all of the uh, presenters, and thank you, all of the attendees who stuck around. I hope you enjoyed our session. Thanks, everyone.